Come and thank you. I'm sure a lot of you all came tonight not really knowing what the Cherokee path was, but looking forward to finding out. Um, this slideshow is actually I put together over a four-year period. My wife Jane over here was still teaching kindergarten after 34 years. Can you believe it? You know, I can do what she does for about 20 minutes. <coughs> but anyway, Jane was still in school. And I told the editor of the Wildlife Magazine, I said, as long as I've been writing, I have been seeing references to the colonial governor of South Carolina coming up to, we live in the Pickens Table Rock area near Lake Kiwi and Joe Cassie, coming up to Fort Prince George, which is now under Lake Kiwi, that's 250 miles in 1750. How could you find your way from downtown Charleston up here with 1,200 troops, 50 wagons, and all the entourage that goes with getting a governor from one place to the other? It just doesn't seem possible in the 1750s. And I, and, and I see numerous references to this thing called the Kiwi Trail. I said, what do you think if I just spend some time checking this out? And he said, yeah, he said, I'm not sure there's a story there, but see what you can do. So over a four-year period, when Jane was off during the summers, we traveled all over the state where known locations were. And there were some available on the internet. And so we'd go there and say, we'd go to Monk's Corner and stay four days. And one of the things I've learned about South Carolina is in every little crossroads town in the state, there's exactly one person who knows the history of that area since the great <laughs> flood. It's just a matter of finding that person. So it really was a process of discovery, and I think the story is compelling. This is lost history. This is history you didn't learn in high school. The stories uh, that go along with various waypoints like 96, Fort Prince George, the Congarees in Columbia, now Casey, uh, and on and on and on. So I don't know how far we're going to get. The Cherokee Path just in South Carolina is 300 miles and covers 200 years of history, so probably not that far. <laughs> uh, this is the article I wrote, The Key to Carolina, and the title is really the key to the slideshow. It was in 1750 that Colonial Governor James Glenn realized that the entire colony consisted mostly um, mostly Charleston or Charlestown at that time this is the Charleston Peninsula this is where the battery would be now Charleston consisted of a walled or palisaded village or town uh, on the tip end of the peninsula on the Cooper River side and Governor Glenn realized that if you look at the Cherokees they were the most powerful most numerous and most influential tribe in the southeast, and they could be overwhelmed at any time, and the whole thing's over, you know? So he realized that establishing an alliance with the Cherokees was key to Carolina, key to our survival. And, and I've told folks that uh, the French were on an almost daily basis trying to persuade the Cherokees to ally and establish a trade with them. They controlled all of the Mississippi Valley from New Orleans to Canada and moving eastward the British of course had the coastal colonies and the Spanish controlled Florida and if the, if the Cherokees had allied with the French instead of the British we'd all be having croissants for breakfast instead of grits <laughs> So really, I, I say that in a kind of quizzical way, but you know what? We're talking about the future of this country was decided in South Carolina, and largely because if South Carolina had fallen, North Carolina would fall. Same, same situation, Cherokees very dominant in that area. People don't understand that at the time of European contact, the Cherokees claimed territory all the way from Virginia to about Rock Hill and Lancaster and down to Orangeburg and on into Georgia. They controlled a huge area of the southeast. I want to back up because, yeah, this map right here. There were quite a number of Indian paths, some of which were Cherokee and some were Catawba and some were, uh, this one is the Okanichi path, but this is the one I'm talking about. This is Kiwi, where Fort Prince George was. This is 
now under Lake Kiowee. Uh, if you're familiar with that area, Lake Kiowee, when you cross Lake Kiowee on Highway 11, it really was where it was was just out of your view to the left, down the river, uh, down the lake now. So, the genius, in, in terms of my, my query to the editor about how could they work out a route from downtown Charlestown to, it not only went to Fort Prince George, but it actually continued on to Fort Loudoun in Tennessee, almost 500 miles. To, and by the way, it took about three weeks to get from Charleston to Fort Prince George. And how would they avoid crossing the four major river systems in South Carolina? So the genius of the Cherokee Path is it goes all the way from Fort Prince George and the, and the Cherokee village of Kiowee along the west bank of the Saluda River down to where Columbia is now, where Fort Congaree was uh, right at Casey, uh, then staying on the left or west bank of the Congaree River, which is now uh, Lakes uh, Marion and Moultrie, and then uh, right on down the Santee River, right to the Charleston Peninsula, and it ended there. King Street in Charleston today is the Cherokee Path. It was built originally on the Cherokee Path, and you remember the slide I showed you of the Palisaded Village? The Cherokee Path went right through the gates of Charlestown. This is, and I described this in great detail in the article, it's actually the first part, because this was the, the turning point in the story. Like I said, I had all these questions about it and saw these references to it. And Pam mentioned the petroglyphs, and, and during the discovering the uh, circle petroglyphs up on Pinnacle and Table Rock Mountain, um, I developed a good friendship with Tommy Charles, an archaeologist with the Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology, and Tommy's office is in Columbia. Now I was in his office one day, and I was walking down the hall right before you turned to get to his office, and there was this pretty large framed map. And I just stopped to look at it for a minute. It was Muzon's map from 1775, and it showed the Cherokee Path in great detail. And all the way from where it crossed into South Carolina at Earl's Ford on Stuga River to downtown Charleston with landmarks. Of the, and I said, I went to Tommy's I said, Tommy, where did you get this map? And he said, oh, you can buy them at the Carolina Library. It's right across the street. <laughs> He said, they're 13 bucks. And Jane and I literally went running across Pendleton Street, dodging traffic and go over there, and it changed the world for me because I'll tell you something. Surveyors and map makers, even in the 1700s, are some of the most meticulous, artistic um, professionals, I guess, of that colonial period. And my long experience now with not only these old vintage maps from the colonial period, but also plats, which I rely on a lot in writing about history, if a surveyor or a map maker says it was somewhere at the junction of two creeks, that's probably right where it was. So it's a tremendous resource, and I've just blown up the section of interest uh, probably as far as we'll get today. I want you to look at all these roads, Indian trails, this is 1775, coming into one point right here. This is the Cherokee village of Kiowee and Fort Prince George just across the river. And then Sugartown, Toxaway, Oconee, East Totoe, uh, Kwakarachi, New Kiowee, and then right on down here at Clemson uh, would be a Seneca. Yeah, here we go, Seneca. Um, so anyway, the, the detail is just amazing and allowed Jane and I, Jane was the navigator uh, on all of our trips as she is on other, I wrote, also wrote an article about the old colonial era uh, King's Highway down, down along the coast. I mean, you know, Highway 17 is called the King's Highway. I'm talking about the real deal, the one George Washington came down in 1791, 15 miles of which were actually out on the beach. And George Washington wrote in his diary about watching the dolphins playing in the surf and all this. So anyway, Jane used this with these landmarks. The creeks are named. The uh, places like Duet's Corner, which is now due west, was a trading post uh, from William Dews. And I'll just tell you a little side story. You'll see it on maps, uh, what is now due west, as Duet's Corner, D-U-E-T-T-S, Duet's Corner, all sorts of things on maps. People, 
In the colonial era, remember first of all that the Cherokees did not have a written language until 1820. So in terms of, look how Muzan pronounces Seneca, for example, S-E-N-N-E-K-A-W. Kiwi, he pronounces K-E-O-W-A, Kiwohe. Um, East to Toei, uh, E-F-T-A-T-O-E, F to Toei. You have to kind of strain to, to do that one. So all Europeans who came through, folks who could, you know, write in, in coherent sentences, uh, could do is spell things phonetically. Jane taught her kindergarten children to, to, to write phonetically. She wanted them to go ahead and start learning to write and not worry about spelling. Don't worry about punctuation and the rules of grammar. We'll do that in second grade, and third grade, and on and on. But just write things down as you hear them. And that's why you find ten different spellings of Eastatoi, for example. <clears throat> So anyway, I've got all this great detail. Jane's got Muzon's map over here, a modern day road map. And that's how we found our way around. And in that four year period, not only did we document all you're going to see here, but we probably discovered more than a dozen sections uh, just meeting landowners and in many cases I'd go to the county courthouse and go to the probate judge and probate judge will say I've been waiting here for 20 years to come and somebody come ask me about the Cherokee path so and so's got a best preserved section I've ever seen on his property you know and so it's more than a dozen sections that look today like they must have looked in 1760 and you're going to see one right off the bat uh, this is one I just wanted to point out because it does come very close to this area where we are right now. This was the one from Fort Prince George to the Catawba Indian Nation right here. One of the artifacts at the Cherokee Museum in uh, Western North Carolina in Cherokee is one of the soldiers during Grant's campaign of 1761 brought a bullhorn, apparently this was a powder horn, and in a scrimshaw fashion put the entire Cherokee path in scrimshaw on this bullhorn, powder horn. I mean it's all there. Here are the ships in Charleston Harbor. You see the little dots there for the road itself. Here's Monk's Corner, the Congarees, 96, uh, Fort Anyway, it's all there. Even the Battle of Echo up in uh, up in northeastern Georgia. It's an incredible resource. It ended up a family in Ireland had had inherited it through several generations and didn't know what to make of it. Contacted the Smithsonian and they said, "Well, we're not really sure what it is either, but it has something to do with South Carolina. Let's send it down there." And folks in uh, in Charleston said, "Whoa!" And and it ended up being donated to the Charleston Museum. In uh, the bicentennial, 17, uh, 1976, some of you all may remember that, there were big tall sailing ships in Savannah Harbor and Charleston, and, and there was a lady in Oconee County, Margaret Mills Seaborn, who spent about as much time researching the Cherokee Path as I have, uh, maybe even more. I don't know, I kind of doubt that now. But uh, she did a great job. But she only did Oconee detail, but she did it in great detail, probably more detail than I know now. These red dots represent the, uh, the various campaigns of 1751 right on through the Revolutionary War in 1779. And um, yeah, here's what I'm putting this up to show you. This is the Chattooga River. It crossed into South Carolina at Earl's Ford if you're coming from north and that left South Carolina obviously if you're going this way but this traces it back to uh, Fort Prince George. This is the crossing uh, and you can see Miss Justine standing down there. The literal roadbed is right here. This was the ford and you can actually see it continuing on toward Clayton, Georgia right there. <coughs> And, and that's it without Jane, but it's pretty dramatic. What we have found all across the state is in these vestigial or residual sections of the, do you remember you talking about something that was traveled 200 years ago, is if there is any incline in the terrain at all, it's going to be worn down into the terrain 
Uh, two characteristics. Number one, it's going to be worn down into the train a considerable amount, depending on the gradation of the, of the slope and the quality of the soil. And number two, it's going to have a flat bottom. Uh, ditches and gullies are V-shaped because it starts eroding the, the topsoil, which is very loose and friable, so you get this big wide area of erosion. Then when it hits the clay layer, it erodes less and less, and the farther it gets down to the point where it's just a little gully, but it might be a huge ravine. The old colonial era roads still have their flat bottom because they were caused by a different process, and that is if... <laughs> You put 1,200 men, and I'm just using the example of uh, Grant's campaign, when you put 1,200 men on horses with iron horseshoes, 50 wagons of supplies, 175 head of cattle for a movable feast for three weeks for 1,200 men, and that's just one campaign, they pulverize the soil. Everyone that comes through there kind of churns up the soil, then it rains and it washes down. And you do that for 250 years, and you end up with the soil up here and the roadbed down here. So this child can, can find an old colonial era road now at 50 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, we have spotted quite a number of segments and backed up. We are notorious trespassers. I don't care who owns the land. If we suspect it's got the old Cherokee path or some other colonial road on it, we're going to go look at it and then suffer the consequences later. Uh, this is kind of an overview. It's located where War Woman Creek uh, merged with or the confluence of the Chuga River and uh, War Woman Creek is coming in right over here. This is maybe 100 yards downstream from what you were looking at, which is the actual crossing there. But that's the landmark. You can always find it on a map. I am um, standing down in the section of the Cherokee Path, maybe a hundred yards back from the river, and it is incredible. Yes, it is way deeper than, than my head. The, this is the level of the terrain right up here. Jane is standing in the Forest Service, Forest Service gravel access road there. This is all Forest Service land. Looking down, that's how deeply incised it is into the terrain. <clears throat> and every time I go to a place like that, particularly this crossing, which is kind of a historic waypoint on the Cherokee Path, I think of all the folks that we read about in the history books who passed through here. Uh, Governor Glenn, Andrew Pickens, our hometown hero in Pickens County, uh, Revolutionary War hero and great Indian fighter. Uh, he was involved in the Cherokee campaigns as a very young man, 21 years old, as was Francis Marion, believe it or not, the Swamp Fox. This is where he learned his guerrilla war fighting tactics that allowed him to harass the British during the darkest days of the American Revolution, when it appeared all was lost. Everybody was either in prison in downtown Charleston or over in Mount Pleasant or another west. Uh, some had been put on a prison ship in Charleston Harbor, and uh, some were sent to Florida. And Francis Marion escaped because, he's, uh, because he doesn't drink, or he didn't drink. And right before the British took Charleston, Charlestown. Francis Marion had been at a party in Charleston and they were drinking pretty heavily and they'd locked all the doors so nobody could leave and he jumped out the window and broke his ankle. Well he was at his family's plantation back up in Berkeley County recovering from having broken his ankle when the British took Charleston. So he's all we had. Here's this little band of partisans out there harassing the British, you know. He, he reminded me of Ernest T. Bass on Andy of Mayberry, you know. It's me, it's me, it's Ernest T. And he would run up, I'll, I'll tell you the classic uh, Francis Marion attack. is the Battle of Parker's Ferry. They call it a battle. But before Francis Marion and Andrew Pickens and, and some of the others, Thomas Sumter, uh, uh, developed their war fight, their guerrilla war fighting tactics. Battle consisted of everybody gathering in an open field somewhere, one, one side on one or the other. You continue advancing and shooting for a couple of hours, and finally somebody says, Okay, how many you got left? And you add up, uh, you know, the losses on both sides, and whoever has the fewest wins. And then all of a sudden, people start hiding and shooting behind trees and running, and this is the Cherokee way of fighting and whooping and hollering and everything. And at the Battle of Parker's Ferry, which is uh, down just south of Jacksonboro, South Carolina, 
there, uh, there, there's a huge swamp there associated with the Edisto River, and, and it, the only roads have to be built up as a causeway, you know, built up out of dirt that you bring in from somewhere else. And there was a British regiment heading from Charleston to Beaufort, I think, by way of Jacksonboro. And they're walking along this causeway, hody, hody, hody. They don't know anything, but there's a problem. And here comes Francis Marion and his band of merry men up out of the swamp, waylay about 20 of them, and before the smoke has literally cleared, they're gone, in back into the swamp. And they're all just, well, what do we do? You know, you can't follow them. They don't know anything about finding their way in the swamp. So finally, Lord Cornwallis wrote Benjamin Lincoln, who was in charge of the Continental Troops in Charleston, and he said, this is a very unmanly way to fight a war, and would you please make him stop it? <laughs> and of course, Lincoln said, actually, we think he's doing a pretty good job. <laughs> um, and on the Indian side, the Cherokee side, let me just rattle off a couple more. William Moultrie. Uh, also was involved in the Cherokee and the Grant campaign of 1761. Uh, this is William Moultrie of the Battle of Sullivan's Island fame, the fellow who later became governor, designed our state flag. Uh, that's where he learned his early war fighting tactics. Now on the Cherokee side, Oconestota, who is pictured here, would be comparable to Andrew Pickens. He was the general. He was a man of few words, and I'm going to show you Atta Kula Kula in a minute, who was on Chatterbox. I mean, he was literally the Secretary of State for the Cherokee Nation. He was constantly going back and forth down to Charleston to treat with uh, not only Governor Glenn, but also he was going over to Virginia and treating with, uh, dealing with Governor Dinwiddie in Virginia, kind of competing each other with, with each other. In other words, he'd go to Governor Dinwiddie and say, okay, if we start trading skins with you, deer skins with you, how much will you give us per skin? And the guy would say, well, you know, I can give you so much per pound. And then he'd go off down to Charleston and he'd say, look, Governor Dinwiddie wants to give me 12 sterling per deer skin and you're offering three. I think we're going with Dinwiddie. Well, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He was a real serious negotiator. Uh, and a tiny little fellow, I'll show you his picture in a minute. But uh, the similarities between Oconestota, the great warrior of Chota, and I wish I had more time to tell you why he is so prominent in Cherokee history, but he reminds me of Andrew Pickens. See that prominent nose? Hmm, I can't get it backwards. There we go, see there? I'm starting to think maybe they're the same person. Have you ever seen them together? <laughs> this is Dragon Canoe, uh, Atticola Kula's son. Dragon Canoe is famous for several things. He was quite a warrior, a young Turk, uh, very young in terms of the headman of the Cherokee. Usually that was a seniority based system, and he was in his 20s, but he was Atticola Kula's son. And he was so outraged at how the Cherokees had prosecuted the war during what's called the Snow Campaign, or which is actually part of the Revolutionary War, 1776. And uh, he was so, and the Cherokees were thoroughly decimated. That was really the end of the Cherokees in South Carolina. That Dragon Canoe pulled off, formed a separate band called the Chickamaugas up in eastern Tennessee. And if you ever heard of the Chickamaugas, that's who they were, was Dragon Canoe's little band of uh, young Turks who peeled away and said, you guys, you blew it. And, and our whole future is at risk, and we're going to go off over here and do our thing. But I also put in Dragon Canoe's, uh, obviously, charcoal image there, because there are a lot of myths about Cherokees. If any of you all grew up in, in the upper part of South Carolina and you went to Cherokee uh, Reservation in the 1950s, and there was Chief Big Wampum, and for five bucks he'd have his picture taken with you, you know, and he had this big headdress with feathers all down there. That's the western... Plains Indians who dress like this. If you encountered a Cherokee in the 1750s and 60s, he probably was dressed very much like Dragon Canoe. And also a Conestota. Um, this is Atacula Kula. Yeah, right here. See how he's like a head shorter than all the other 
all the other Cherokees. The Cherokees actually were described by most people as being very tall and very robust as compared. Most southeastern Indians were actually pretty small, 5'4", five, 5'6", five, something like this. And even among uh, all the other southeastern tribes, Atacula Kula was probably right around 5'2", five, 5'3", five, short little fellow. Um, but uh, had uh, had an outsized impact or influence on uh, on the future of the Cherokees and the future of the South Carolina colony. Just put this in to remind you that uh, this is all public property. What I've just shown you of Earl's Ford and everything, and well worth the trip. It's a beautiful stretch of the river and a beautiful drive up there. You just go to Long Creek, and uh, if you have a nav system or something, just put in Earl's Ford and it'll take you right there, or a good map. Uh, this this little informational kiosk is probably it's maybe two tenths of a mile or something from this side. Real easy walking down to the river. It's it's very dramatic. Remember that photograph of me standing there. If you if you want to know what these old colonial era roads looked like today, that's it. Uh, it went by this little church. Uh, which is Village Creek Church. Uh, there was a Cherokee village there, a Kochi. You probably didn't see it on that map a while ago because there were several on Margaret Mills Seaborns, but this is the Cherokee path right behind the church. Yeah, that's Margaret Mills Seaborns. I'm going to hurry through a couple of these things because I want to be sure to get through to Fort Prince George. Uh, this is uh, Station Cove right off of Highway 11. If you've ever been there, it's now a state park. Uh, these were actually built after the Revolutionary War or during the later stages, 1792. Uh, after the Revolutionary War in the upcountry of South Carolina, which was largely a civil war, uh, brothers taking different sides and, and family grievances getting settled, that kind of thing. There were bands of, there were variously called outliers or outlaws or just bullies that were roaming the territory. They've lost their family farms. They've lost their sources of income. They're mostly disgruntled, displaced hellions. And they were just tormenting the settlers in the upcountry of South Carolina who had both just gone through two, two Cherokee Wars and the Revolutionary War. And they're raping and ravaging and stealing and murdering. And so South Carolina had what was called the regulator movement. The state government, newly formed state government, hired patrols all over the state to go and just be on constant patrol for these outliers or, or um, outlaws. And the uh, Richards House right here, right here was the first outpost there. The, the second one was built as a, yeah. That's a Kiwi State Park. No, that, this is closer to Walhalla than Kiwi. In other words, if you continue on down Highway 11 before you get to the point where you drop off Highway 11 on 183 to go to Walhalla, maybe two miles back, uh, look for a sign that's at Picket Post. And it'll say Station Cove. It's a beautiful area to go to right now because across from what you're looking at here, you park out on a paved road. The opposite direction of the paved road that takes you to these buildings goes to a waterfall and a botanical area. It's called Station Cove Botanical Area. Oh man, I just did a wildflower walk uh, a couple days ago. Day before yesterday, wasn't it? I don't know. Anyway, at Pearson's Falls up here at Saluda, man, it's, if it's not peaking right now, it's very close. Gleason's, Trillium, everywhere. Uh, it was just a wonderful experience, so this would be a good time to go. So if you were just uh, in that section of Highway 11 in the vicinity of Walhalla, look for a sign for Picket Post. It's a little community there. Turn right. Picket Post. Picket. Uh, there is a big brown sign because it's a state. It's not a state park. It's a state historic area. Scott Alexander is the interpreter there. And if you happen to be there when Scott's there, he has a wealth of information and a Revolutionary War uh, reenactor. Bill anyway, Cherokee Path. Station Cove Falls is the, that's what's across the road from the buildings you just saw. Uh, and actually the path to Station Cove Falls is the old Cherokee Path. This is it right here. They've got these logs here. So the walking path is over here and they want to keep you off of that. And they're also trying to stop erosion. But you see how it's worn down into the train, has a flat bottom. Uh, <clears throat> this is the point where uh, the old Cherokee Path and the hiking trail diverge. 
the waterfall goes this way and the old Cherokee path continues on up over Oak Oconee Mountain. Oh, this is Station Cove. This is dead of winter, but it is a botanical wonderland. If you're familiar with the, the little crimson flowered, low-growing low trillium, uh, trillium cuneatum, uh, Little Sweet Betsy, millions of them in there. So, and I'm not exaggerating. Uh, this is very near Station Cove. This is the site of Andrew Pickens' retirement home. He actually died sitting in a rocking chair right there on top of that little knoll. This is Tomasi Knob and the famous ring fight uh, where Andrew Pickens described as his last and most desperate battle. He actually thought he wouldn't survive. Uh, they were attacked and this is where, where it was a hard lesson, but this is where, where you learn guerrilla war fighting tactics. He had a, uh, a band of militia, about 20 fellows who are basically just armed farmers. They're going up to Mossy Creek and they get attacked. No sign of any problem. They get attacked in all, from all directions by Cherokees who are hiding behind trees and whooping and hollering. And by the time they figure out what's going on, they're being fired on from all directions. And um, out of desperation, it occurred to Andrew Pickens it was a cane break. Well, this river cane used to be an extensive, homogeneous, nothing but cane. And he knew from experience, being a, a farmer before the war, that when you burn cane, it pops and cracks like gunfire. <laughs> and he set the cane break on fire. And he told the men to get down on one knee and fire at will, you know, when you see somebody. And so he starts the cane break on fire, and he goes, pow, 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 pow. And the Cherokees say, oh no, there's more of them than we thought. <laughs> and they dissipated out into the woods, and it's really what saved that's what saved Andrew Pickens' life. And so when the war was over, he acquired this property, built his house right here called the Red Top House. The Cherokees, uh, uh, the, the color red was the symbol of war. They used red war paint and carry red emblems and stuff during times of war and only during times of war. And he painted his house red because he was considered and highly revered from the Cherokees. Uh, they called him Skilgunsta, and a lot of people think that was a name called Wizard Owl. It does not mean Wizard Owl. Skilgunsta is actually a title more than a name. There was a Skilgunsta of Kiwi, for example. It's like War Chief. Um, the, I just, I'm not going to go any more into that, but it does not mean Wizard Owl, even though whole books have been written on Andrew Pickens, the Wizard Owl. Uh, Anyway, one of the reasons that he was drawn to this particular tract of property, my old friend Tommy Charles set the corner of Jumping Branch and Tomasi Knob Road. Uh, and there's a granite monument there. Uh, this is Tomasi Knob, and that's where his house was. Put up, I think, in 1935. Yeah. 1932. Um, to, you know, just demarking the fact that that was Andrew Pickens. Um, right across the road, from where that marker is, this field right here, Tommy, I was riding down this road one time with Tommy, and Tommy pointed over there and he said, that's where Tomasi was. And I said, you mean the Indian village Tomasi? Because I've read about it, but I really didn't have a concept of where it was, just knew it was in Oconee County. He said, yeah, we excavated it and we found the chief's vest coat because it had brass buttons on it. We had a documentary record of him having been given this, this, uh, this waistcoat. Uh, and, and that's just a little better view of the road and, and Tabasi Dobb and Andrew Pickens' house will be on the right and Tabasi Indian Village on the left. Uh, this is the only, until recently, the only historical marker to the Cherokee Path in the Upstate. It's on Highway 11 in the vicinity of Pickett Post and, and that area there. There are, there are two brand new ones I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, this one was put up, I think, in the 1950s, and hardly anybody knows where it is now. It's on the Oconee County side, and it's abandoned, and doesn't do anybody any good. This body of water right here is where Fort Prince George and the Indian Cherokee village of Kiwi is. A couple years ago, the local DAR chapter in Greenville 
These are not cheap, and I'm working on one right now. They're about $2,000 a piece, and it takes about a year to get them done. As a matter of fact, as recently as this morning, I was working with the Department of Archives and History on the text for one for the East Toy Valley, and we're, we're getting close. But anyway, they put up a really nice two-sided. You can buy them one side or the other. This is two-sided. Tells some of the story that, uh, that I've just told you. And that's at Mile Creek Park, which is the only county-owned park in Pickens County. It's really nice. It's right on Lake Kiwi and directly across from where Fort Prince George and Kiwi Town was. As a matter of fact, this is standing on a knoll in Mile Creek Park. And this is the location here where Crow Creek, the Kiwi River and that other shot was taken from right there. So this big body of water right here is where Fort Prince George was. And this is uh, Margaret Mills Seaborns. This is the Cherokee path coming from DeWitt's corner, or Dews, Dews corner, due west. Uh, the ford at Fort Prince George across the river to Kiwi Town on the Oconee County side was originally called Birch's Ford, and the red dots here represent the Cherokee Path uh, <coughs> and all the dates for the various expeditions through there. This is actually an old plat, um, 1790s of the of the same property I just showed you. This is Crow Creek, which is now under the lake. Uh, the old Charleston Road coming in Fort Prince George here, and then Cherokee, Cherokee Village of Kiwi there, and shows the road continuing on up to Sugartown, and then to Toxaway and East Atoy. What a rare thing! And like I say, when when surveyors put something on there, that's probably where it was. <laughs> Another plat uh, shows the Cherokee. What's interesting about this one, it not only shows the Star Fort, Fort Prince George, but in 1761, after the, the Battle of Echo Pass, which the British prevailed, the year before they had been defeated really pretty, had been beaten pretty badly at Echo Pass. They were attacked guerrilla war style. Again, they were passing through this narrow gap in the mountains and attacked from all sides and really had to turn around and, and retreat back to Charleston. But then the following year, James Grant came through there and, and was successful. And then he came back to Fort Kiwi, I mean, uh, Fort Prince George at Kiwi to kind of recover before making the trip back to Charleston. And he added on a section of Fort Prince George, which is this section right here to the original, basically, uh, star fort design there. Uh, that's the outline of the fort now. It was excavated uh, in that period when Duke Power Company announced that they were going to be flooding what is now Lake Jocassee and Lake Kiwi. Gave archaeologists a little less than a year. And we got like nine Indian villages and, and Fort Prince George and all this kind of stuff, so you got to set priorities. They did a relatively thorough excavation of Fort Prince George. Uh, I think I showed you Toxaway, where Toxaway, you know, Cherokee Village was. That's the only, of the Indian towns, that's the only one they did the excavation of. But fortunately, we do have good documentation of all aspects of uh, Fort Prince George because I'm working now, uh, I'm the Blue Wall Vice President of the Pickens County Historical Society and we are seriously on track trying to build a reconstruction of Fort Prince George. There is a reconstruction of Fort Loudon in Tennessee. It's been there since the TVA days. It was part of the mitigation for building the TVA lakes. And we didn't get a thing out of Duke uh, in, in terms of Native Americans during the recent renegotiations for relicensing the Kiwi Toxway project. So we're having to raise funds from scratch, but Upstate Forever is helping us a lot. Various organizations are now coming forward. We hope to build it at Mile Creek Park that I just showed you, but not on the park property. All of that is pretty much d dedicated to some other purpose. There's 23 acres that's available immediately adjacent to Mile Creek Park. It's perfect, the situation, plenty of bus parking, this kind of thing, and so we're moving on that right now and moving right along. And really the nice thing about it, um, 
we have all this very detailed historical documentation because when Governor Glenn promised Atticula Cooler to build Fort Prince George in 1753, he had no support among the House of Commons. You know, their world, the House of Commons, which was mostly rice planters, they had their, their concept of South Carolina only extended about five miles out of Charleston. Anything else was Indian territory, and they could care less. And so, you know, Governor Glenn says, "Look, you know, this is key to Carolina. Our success is based on on, on establishing alliance with the Cherokees." And you get this, you know, slack-jawed deer in the headlights look, like, "Who are the Cherokees? Who could? Well, we don't care." So he had no money, and uh, so every keg of nails that he requisitioned to send up to Fort Prince George, even the lengths of chain, which happened to have been nine feet long, that they raised and lowered the gate of the fort with had to be requisitioned individually and accounted for and paid for before they left Charleston. So, the good thing is, now that documentary record is there. When we say a meticulously historical accurate reconstruction I mean it's going to be down to the gauge of the chains the the, the dimensions of the buildings the bore of the, the cannons everything will be done to specifications and this is uh, Marshall Williams who was one of the archaeologists who worked on the excavation after the project was over with toothpicks and ice cream popsicles things and stuff <laughs> did a historically accurate to scale model of Fort Prince George and we are now heir to it, the Pickens County Historical Society and it's at the Pickens Museum on display. Um, and of course uh, there was a great deal of news coverage over the archaeological exped expedition excavation during that period. This is the footprint Duke had already cleared the vegetation, the trees, and everything, and you could actually see the footprint of Fort Bridge George from an airplane. Uh, these are post hole moles right here. So these black dots outline where the buildings were. You can actually project where the dimensions are. Uh, this is the well in the center. Uh, they actually uh, this requires some explanation, but this is actually the skeleton of Lieutenant Cotamore, who was the ensign in charge, or was the commander in charge of Fort Prince George at the time. Remember Oconestota, great warrior of Chota? Uh, I think this is worthwhile stepping by the side and telling me the story, because it, it really was a story that helped determine the future of South Carolina. Governor Glenn was recalled on a mission, on a trip up to Fort Prince George, and he got to 96, Fort 96, and he got an emissary coming up from Charleston and said he'd been relieved of his duties and assigned to be the governor of the Bahamas. So he turns around and he heads back. Well, the new sheriff in town is a Governor William Henry Littleton. Different character totally from Governor Glenn, who had a tremendously good working relationship with the Cherokees, the Catawbas, Chickasaws, uh, everybody, uh, all the Native American tribes in South Carolina, long-standing good relationship with them. William Henry Littleton comes on board, young, brash fellow. My daddy used to say he was one of those people who thinks too much of themselves. And he comes in and he sends for Atacula Kula and 24 headmen from all the lower towns, the middle towns, and the overhills in Tennessee to come down to Charleston and to meet with him. Which is fine enough. He's the new governor. He wants to meet with him. So they come down, and there have been, and, and I just, I'm not going to go so far back as to explain why, but there had been some attacks, Indian attacks on settlers. It was a serious disagreement and uh, some murders, that kind of thing. So when they get to Charleston, Governor William Henry Littleton puts the entire Cherokee delegation in chains and puts them in the dungeon down below Charleston and within three days marches them back up to, to Fort Prince George in chains. You can imagine how humili humiliating this is for Cherokees uh, who, who are a very circumspect uh, person, people, uh, 
They went down there at the governor's request. They didn't do anything wrong, and he's marching back up to in, to Charleston. When they get back up to Fort Prince George, uh, Atticola Cooler negotiated with with Littleton to release Oconestota himself, Atticula Kula, and one other, I think the young warrior of East Atoy. Yeah, those three. Well, Oconestota, like I said, is a man of few words. He goes across the river to uh, Cherokee Indian Village, spends a few days, and comes up with a plan. And the plan is, I'll just tell you how it played out. One foggy morning, he appears standing on the side of the Kiowee River in the brush border along the river. It's kind of, you know, how the fog settles around a river and when it rises, a conestota is standing there. And the guard at the gate sees him and says, what do you want? He says, I want to talk to Lieutenant Cottermore. I want to go back down to Charleston and talk to Governor Littleton and try to work this thing out, but I need a horse. I brought my own bridle. But I need a horse, and I need to be accompanied by somebody from Fort Prince George. And he said, well, that's above my pay grade. You're going to have to talk to Lieutenant Cotamore. So he calls Lieutenant Cotamore out, who comes out with his assistant, uh, and they walk maybe half the distance from the gate of the fort down so they can actually have a conversation with a Conestota. And as Lieutenant Cotamore approaches um, uh, a Conestota down on the riverside, a Conestota takes the bridle and waves it over his head three times, which is a prearranged signal for about 40 Cherokee warriors to come up out of the brush border along the river. Well, they waylay Lieutenant Cotamore and Lieutenant Bell, who was uh, accompanying him, killed Cotamore. He didn't dare die right away. Soldiers come running out. Uh, they drug him back in the fort. He died two or three days later. And I didn't tell you that the ones who were not released... The three that I that I named you that Atticula Kula had negotiated the release, they were keeping them in a stockade, 22 of them, in a stockade designed for six people. And so the soldiers, upon hearing that Lieutenant Cotamore had been murdered against direct orders, went in and killed all 22 of the Cherokee headmen. It was said at the time that there was not a Cherokee alive in the Carolinas or Georgia or Tennessee who was not either related to or knew or had a relationship with one of those 22. Well, that instant started the Cherokee Wars of 1759, and the rest is, is history. During the archaeological excavation, this would have been around 1968 and 69 because they flooded Lake Kiwi and Joe Cassie in 71. I remember because my father got me a job driving a dump truck my freshman year at Clemson. Uh, I'm working on Highway 11 and uh, Kiwi and Toxway. So they actually excavated Lieutenant Cotamore's body. William Bartram, America's firstborn and certainly most celebrated native uh, naturalist, uh, came through Kiwi and Fort Prince George, and I was talking earlier about how people spell things phonetically, how they heard it. And if you, you some of you all probably have William Bartram's travels, uh, his monumental work on the botany, and, and actually lots of really important observations about the Native Americans, and this was during the Revolutionary War period. He came through 1775, so things were hot during that period of time. But William Bartram came through both the Cherokee village of Kiwi and Fort Prince George, which he described as being nothing more than a trading post. By 1776, it was just a trading post. So it didn't last all that long, about 16 years. Interestingly, he spells in his book, Kiwi, K-I-W-I, Kiwi. <laughs> you know, like the fruit. <laughs> um, but William Bartram provided some of our best, and, and I won't get into all the detail, but he provided some of the best detail about what the Cherokee Village Kiwi looked like. He described the council house. I'm not sure it was the one at council. If it wasn't at Kiwi, it was at Cowie, which was up near Franklin, North Carolina. The grand council house in the center of the Cherokee Villages. Archaeologists divide all Cherokee population centers into three categories, either towns like Kiwi Town, 
which usually had a central council house where the other villages would come to. Villages, uh, which could be quite large and maybe the same number of people, but didn't have the council house and the game play, ball playing yard and that kind of thing. Uh, East Atoy, for example, had ex almost exactly the same number of residents, about 200 at Kiwi and at East Atoy, but didn't have a council house. And thirdly, a hamlet is mostly a clan-based cluster of, of houses, and it be, might be quite distinct, quite a number of miles between the mother town and where this clan has established a little hamlet. And sometimes they were seasonal, didn't live there year-round, but towns, villages, and hamlets. Um, but anyway, it gave us a pretty good description of Kiwi, uh, and this is very much like it, what it would have looked like, a palisaded village. Uh, this would have been the big council house, all the other. Uh, there were usually, for each individual family unit, they had three types of buildings. A hot house for the winter, and these things were so well insulated that they actually usually didn't wear clothes during the winter because it was so hot in there. A little central campfire and a little smoke hole up there but generated a lot of heat and retained a lot of heat. Um, and then the council house itself. He described, I believe it was the one up at Cowie near near Franklin as being able to hold 400 people. 400 people. That's about, what do we got here, 80, something like that? That's about four times as big as this room right now. That's quite a, a structure to have been constructed with just, just materials, you know, poles and sticks, bark and this kind of stuff in the 1750s and earlier. Uh, when the old Cherokee path left Fort Prince George down river, this is actually where that paved road is. That's, that's now Lake Kiwi. This is where it came up out of the floodplain, the river floodplain, onto the high ground heading toward, uh, that's a Gap Hill Landing there, uh, right next to where I took that photograph, and then it starts uphill there to a place that's famous. It's called, it was called the Battle of, of Gap Hill, and it's described in the history and there are precious few of them, but there are some historical accounts of it. Apparently Francis Marion and, and Andrew Pickens were involved in this attack. Uh, it describes it as being two hill, the gap between two hills like the humps on a back tree in camel. Well, Jane and I spent some time trying to find this place because where we were told it was, was flat as a flitter. There are no holes, and I didn't have a clue what a back tree in a camel was. I had to Google that. <laughs> And I found out pretty quickly there are two types of camels. There's a dromedary camel, which has one big hump, and then there's a Bactrian camel, which has two. So we start riding around looking for a couple of Bactrian camel humps in the, in the surrounding areas, and lo and behold, just above that bait and tackle place, we, asked, we went in and asked the fellow who owns this property over here, because we can see the old Cherokee path leading off up through the woods, and she, he said, told us who he was, and he said, it uh, doesn't matter, I know the guy, go ahead. I had on my Wildlife Magazine shirt, so he figured I was official. So we get up there, and lo and behold, this is it. Look at this flat bottom. The Cherokees had hidden behind trees, new Grant, uh, this was supposed to have been during the Grant campaign of 1761, knew he was coming, uh, because you know they had outposts during this time of the Cherokee Wars all along at various points, knew they were coming, and they, just like Echo Pass up near Franklin, North Carolina, they ambushed them from the humps of this back tree and camel over there, and uh, actually did did some serious damage. And the day we were there, there's safety zone, no shooting signs, and I told Jane, I said, you know, if these signs had been up in 1761, it'd have saved a lot of lives. <laughs> And then uh, you can actually see this is Gap Hill Baptist Church, maybe a mile and a half, a little farther down the paved road. This is where we were told it was. And you can see it's flat as a flitter around there. There's not so much as a hump, but the old Cherokee Path is right behind the church. Uh, and that's actually a pretty good section of it. You can see, if you kind of project a line across through there, it's what, Jane, four or five feet worn down into the terrain. Uh, some of the trees that they have left and obviously somebody knew this was an important historic road and left these old some of these white oaks along the edge of it are 200 years old as a matter of fact there's a stump of one that looks like it was cut six eight ten years ago and uh, i couldn't count the rings but it's clearly a 200 year old tree uh, then it intersects with highway 183 
and continues on in the direction of that red truck there um, to a place uh, that we have good historical documentation on. I have about six journals meticulous journals of soldiers in the various campaigns, all the way from Charleston to, to Fort Loudoun. Uh, and, and Six Mile Campground and the crossing at Six Mile was a, a, an important waypoint because it had good water, good flat terrain. See, you had to travel with literally a movable feast of cattle and flour and biscuits and all that it takes to support 1,000, 1,200 people. Most of the wagon trains, the one in Montgomery's campaign in 1760, for example, was estimated to be two miles long. So anyway, this is the six mile crossing. Uh, you get a little better look at it in a minute right now. This sign is up. It's, uh, it, was, uh, it had been various things. It was a gun works at one time, a grist mill, a cotton seed mill. And finally, in the 1920s, somebody put in an elect first generator and electric generator for the town of Six Mile there. Uh, the property was for sale uh, when, when we stopped in. It has been sold. This is the show. Now, one of the things uh, that we learned uh, all across the state was, when, you know, I talked about the genius of the Cherokee Path is it avoided crossing all four major rivers in South Carolina, but they did have to cross some pretty considerable streams. You picked the ford, the place to cross the stream has to have a hard bottom. If it's just sand and clay, it's good for about one use and then it's a mud hole. And it's going to get worse. Everybody that comes through there. So it's got to have a rock bottom. So at the top of this shoal, which is nothing more than an outcropping under a river, in a riverbed, it has a hard bottom. And there it is. There it is right there. This is the rock shelf. The waterfall that you just saw starts just off of the, the shot right here, maybe 20 feet down to the, that's the old Cherokee path coming across through here. And it's very deeply incised. That's looking downstream from where that shot was taken. So it's the literal top of that cascade. This is the old Cherokee path right there at that point. I don't think it's ever had a bulldozer on it. It is just wonderful. And we have told the property owner who had just acquired it what it was. This is the flat area that I'm convinced was probably the campground. Then left there and went on to now the town of Six Mile. And I know I'm telling a lot of stories, but... Uh, uh, you'll see some things with Cherokee Indians and a, and a historical marker in a minute. Let me give you the backstory on that. You know, I told you I was the Blue Wall Vice President of the Pickett's County Historical Society. Well, two or three, four years ago, about three years ago, I think, we had a new member. He was a, uh, James Atkinson, he was a city councilman or town councilman for the town of Six Mile. And a really nice fellow, and I didn't talk to him because he was at the end of the board meeting table until about the third meeting. And when I finally did talk to him, I said, well, James, it, re it really surprises me that you all, the town of Six Mile, don't make a big deal about the fact that the Cherokee Path is Main Street in Six Mile. And he said, well, maybe it's because we didn't know. <laughs> and he said, tell me about it. So I told him, you know, about the Cherokee Path and everything. Well, the mayor got real excited about this. And he said, can you put together a slideshow to come show the town council and we'll pursue getting a historical marker out there and make a big deal about this. Well, he did, and I did. And believe it or not, this is six miles South Carolina now. I don't know what the population is, but there was like 160 people showed up for this, this slideshow presentation. I remember I started out the presentation with, because I was talking about, the you know, I said something like six mile has, what does six mile have in common with downtown Charleston because uh, the, the, the correct answer is the Cherokee Path went down the, the middle of both and this lady says, not much. <laughs> and she's probably right, but. <laughs> okay, this is looking down the Main Street of Pickens and I guess third and finally, I keep telling you these things that Janie and I discovered over the four years of researching this thing. One fundamental principle we found and again it's one of those 
keys to success for a road, a primitive road all across the state, is it's almost always up on the highest ridge anywhere around. And when they got up on a big ridge, they would stay on it as long as it's generally heading. For example, there's a big ridge between Greenwood and Saluda, South Carolina. And it's about 20, 22 miles, something like that. It's on one big ridge. It's, it's Highway 178, and as you ride it, you can really, you could see it drop off over here, and you could see it drop off over here, and then it kind of diverges and goes a little different route between Saluda and Lexington, South Carolina. But anyway, Six Mile is up on a very prominent ridge, and drops off quite dramatically on both sides. So this is the old Cherokee Path, and... Uh, that's the slide I was looking for, Jane. I told Jane up here my one regret was I thought I had lost this slide of the British troops, you know, in mountain terrain, and I was going to put it up front when I'm talking about all the troops. I couldn't find the thing. Well, it's embedded in the slideshow, <laughs> not where it should be. Okay, i got to tell you this story before the historical marker. The, the day or two after I did the slideshow presentation, to the town council, I got a call from a fellow. He said he was a metal detector. This is his hobby. He's a realtor in Clemson, Russ Abair. And uh, this is his hobby. He works with Clemson University, some of their old historic sites. He doesn't keep any of the artifacts. He donates them. And anyway, he's totally legit. And he said, I can't believe, I didn't know anything about your presentation. I would love to have come. But he said, you're not going to believe this. But he said, and without disclosing locations, he said, I have found one of the British military encampments almost within sight of Main Street in Six Mile, and I'd love for you to see my collection. And he said, would you like to see it? And I said, would I? <laughs> and so Jay and I met him in Pickens, and this is literally out of the back of his car. You will not believe what this fellow has uncovered. Here are the, you know, the bullets that you'll find at any military campsite. A key, this is a pocket knife, uh, another pocket knife, belt buckles, a spoon. This is actually a pencil, a lead pencil. You could take it and write a letter to your best friend with that now. Now here's, here's what just blows me away. Not the buckle, not the pencil. This coin, look at that coin, 1744. I mean, that's what an incredible artifact. And here's why I like Russ Abair. He found this site on private property that had been planted in pines, and at one point, some point, would be harvested. A bulldozer would come in, push everything off to the side, replant the pines, and nobody would ever know those artifacts are there. And at least now, because he's kind of gotten caught up in what I do, and that is show the slideshow on the Cherokee Pass, sometimes we, in the same night, at the same location, he'll follow me up and do that. And now people are starting to request him. He has a wonderful slideshow, Pam. He is an expert in British military uh, campaigns all across South Carolina and does a great slideshow. But I'm just blown away with these artifacts. And it's very gratifying to know that somebody like Russ is out there doing this because these are artifacts that we would never know about. Uh, they would just eventually get pushed off somewhere and maybe be buried never to be rediscovered. Rest of this, uh, this segment is just aerial photos that I showed to the town council to kind of prove my case. These are 1950s era uh, plants. Now, when we got the, finally got the Cherokee Path um, the historical marker, like I said, it takes about a year. I, unbeknownst to me, the, you know, I got an invitation to the dedication ceremony. There was a delegation of Cherokees there. And believe it or not, I've gotten to know well, most of these elders since then quite well, Jane and I both. Is, is oh, This is a statistic you can use at a cocktail party sometime, which will blow people's mind, but you can tell them Dennis Chastain says it's true. <laughs> there are more Cherokees living in South Carolina today than there were in 1780. And it just tells you much of what I've told you about the Cherokee path. Continues on from there. 
to where it crossed, uh, well it goes by a place called Camp Creek Baptist Church just outside of Six Mile. Now I have asked around and I've looked at the church history. Why is this called Camp Creek Church? Nobody seems to know. I think I know. It's because it was a campsite for folks coming up from Charleston. It's on the other side of Six Mile from where um, Russ Hebert found the British artifact. It has a creek down behind it for watering cattle right there. It's big flat, uh, top of a big flat ridge where you could put up the required number of tents. And, uh, and I'd say within three quarters of a mile of Camp Creek Baptist Church is a well-documented, well-known crossing on 12 Mile River of the Cherokee Path. It's very deeply, this is an old plat right here. This is the 12 Mile River. This is the old, they call it Kiwi Road in many cases. But this is a plat showing it right here. Well documented. So I'm convinced Camp Creek Baptist Church is, it was a campground during that period. Uh, if y'all don't mind, we're probably getting toward the end of uh, your interest level or patience level. If you don't mind, let me skip through some things and get to Fort 96. I think we'll leave off there and you need to know about it. It is also one of the best preserved, most accessible sections. Other than Earl's Ford, yeah, there's Princess Jane. <laughs> Again, uh, one of the best preserved sections that's on public owned land in South Carolina. This, this is going through Pendleton. And then uh, we're almost there. Due west. By the way, let me back up and tell this quick story. This is Park Seed. I imagine many of you know where it is or maybe gone to the Flower Festival down there every year. Well, one of our sources told us that it went right in front of Park Seed, right in front of the, the gardens out there. So Jane and I pull in. We're not bashful. We pull in one time and ask. Uh, and I happen to know that Karen Park owned it at that time. She was George Park, the original founder's granddaughter, and she had recently in inherited it, and it was in the news and everything. So we asked for Karen Park, and, and the people we were talking to said, well, she's not here today, and it's her husband who knows about the Cherokee Path. He's actually done quite a study and researched old plats and everything, and he owns a bookstore in downtown Greenwood. On Main Street. So we go down there, and it turns out there's nobody in the store. The guy spends an hour with us, pulls out all of his old plats, and proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that it actually ran right diagonally across from this is the entrance to the to, to the gardens there. The experimental gardens ran diagonally across through there. Right across the road, uh, you can see it going off into these woods, and then the next stop is this historical marker, which takes you down the road to this is an old cemetery out in the woods, and lo and behold, there it is, right there in front of that cemetery. It's, if you just followed that road on that course, it would be maybe a tenth of the mile back to Park C. So anyway, a lot of our adventures have been one thing leads to another. Okay, now we're to Fort 96, and a lot of people don't understand this is at the entrance to Fort 96. It has a, a dedication here too. I think it says so, yeah, to commemorate the Cherokee Path or the Cherokee Trail in Old 96. A lot of people don't understand that there are two things on this site called Fort 96. One is the Star Fort, which is the more famous of the two, and it's a Revolutionary War fort. There is the old Cherokee War Fort at, at Robert Gowdy's barn, which consisted of Robert Gowdy, the Indian trader at Fort 96, at 96 at that time. They just whipped up a palisade around his barn and his house, and it was a place of refuge for local residents where the Cherokees were about to attack. Everybody would gather it at Gowdy's barn, and it became known as as uh, Fort 96, that you find that a lot. Fort Thickety, for example, in, in Spartanburg County, it was just somebody's tobacco barn that they put a palisade up and it was a point of refuge and they'd try to defend it. Uh, a lot of these, these uh, Revolutionary War and Indian War forts were nothing more than that. Here's the 
path leading out to the star fort. You can see this raised ground here. That's actually the footprint of the star fort. Uh, this is Robert Gowdy's actual plat. It shows Wagon Road right through here. That is the Cherokee path running right through his property. And I think this is interesting. There were five roads coming into or going out of, depending on your perspective, out of Fort 96. Uh, one of them goes down to Augusta, which Jenny and I have now spent uh, a fair amount of time tracking all the way from Fort 96 to the old uh, town of Hamburg. Island Ford, which crossed uh, the Saluda River, uh, heading to the Catawba Nation. Kiwi, which is the one I wrote about and then another Charleston road that ended up in Charleston but went through Orangeburg and by Fort Dorchester, that route. Here's what I wanted you to see. This is, they got a little sign there, Historic Cherokee Path, probably, and that's yours truly, walking to Charleston, heading off to Charleston on the Cherokee Path. This is my shoulder and this is the surrounding terrain. This is how deeply incised this thing is into the terrain. Uh, this is the old Charleston Road here, even deeper into the terrain. And then due west, I've already told you that story, I think. So I hope you all enjoyed it and maybe learned a little something too. Good.